Okay. And so the uh, first speaker is uh, Steve Hatfield Dodds. He's uh, Chief Research Leader in the Integration Science and Public Policy at CSIRO and also Adjunct Professor at Crawford School. Join me in welcoming Steve. So, thanks very much, uh, Frank. Uh, I'm going to talk, uh, unusually for me, mostly about uh, the situation in the electricity network and, and not so much about, about climate change. Um, uh, because I really like Frank, I'll start by criticising him. Um, the, the, the ultimate goal is, is, is negative emissions electricity rather than merely zero. Um, but I won't, I won't go much further on that. Gee, you teach so many graduate <coughs> students at high quality that you've worn the arrows off your buttons. But I, I hope that's the right one. So there's, there's lots of um, causes of disruption in the electricity sector. Um, some of those are to do with climate and some of them are indirectly to do with climate um, policies, uh, but some of them are not. Uh, there are profound social changes uh, going on. Uh, there are uh, different expectations uh, from, from consumers. There's different risk profiles out in the um, uh, heavy uh, energy users. And there's these, you know, the, the technologies which I'll talk more about. But before we come to that, I'm going to go through three different uh, reports that CSIRO uh, has done. The, the first is the, the National Outlook. Um, and so this was a high-level uh, cross-sector project. Um, one of the, the interesting things and complicating things about it was we're looking at seven or eight different sectors all at once. And we're trying to understand the, in a sense, the cross-sectoral dynamics and the interactions. So not only did we have to go and tell uh, eight or ten government departments what we were doing so they wouldn't get annoyed with us later on. Um, it, it allowed us to think about, you know, if water goes in this direction, what's the implications of that for electricity? And if land use goes in that direction, what's the implications of that for transport fuels? And what are the, the, the two-way interactions? Um, and the, the messages, uh, the, the findings out of that were threefold, but the, the main one was though, though we modelled Australia in detail in a very wide range of global contexts, we found that Australia had a lot of uh, autonomy or a lot of agency in choosing how it responded to different potential trends. Um, so that was, that was good news, not too surprising, but then some really interesting stuff about how, because the, the suite of models we were using gave a lot of granularity, a lot of information on different types of environmental pressure, so water stress, biodiversity loss, greenhouse gas emissions, uh, and so on. We found that there was a, a whole bunch of sectors uh, where the economy went well and the environment uh, did not. Uh, and so people's aspects of their well-being that rely on the environment didn't do well either. But then there were another, another subset of scenarios uh, where they did really well. And in fact, that, that both the economic performance was better than under existing trends, the sort of the middle ground pathway, uh, and the environmental performance was better. And that, those outcomes were primarily driven by policy choices uh, where choices Australia could feasibly make, these were not, uh, sorry, it's not very socially radical inside, these were not uh, wacky, weird, um, optimistic, utopian scenarios, they were pretty standard scenarios. <coughs> so the context for that work uh, was that the world economy is going to grow, and it's going to grow a lot, and that's not mostly driven by population growth, so population goes from uh, 7 or so billion in some uh, up to 11, but in the middle one up to 9, so that's only a 20 25% increase, um, <clears throat> but in contrast to a 25% increase in, in population, uh, the size of the global economy triples. Um, that implies roughly tripling of global energy demand, uh, and depends a little bit across the, the scenarios. Uh, but for Australia in particular, you've got this, can I try the pointer? Yes, got this big red block, so that's China now. So this line here is the high income threshold for the World Bank, so that's 12,000 dollars US, that's roughly when your kids stop drawing of malnutrition. Uh, China goes from here a third of the way behind, below that line, to roughly almost three times above that line. So the, the number of people in high income countries, not the number of people who aren't in poverty, but the number of people in high income countries uh, triples, and most of them live next door. Um, so that, that does a whole pile of stuff at the global scale uh, about the economy tripling, uh, res global resource extraction doubling and those sorts of things. 
And so <laughs> the issue is that that's going to happen. Economic growth is good news uh, overwhelmingly in lots of factors, but it has some downside as well if we don't manage it properly. Uh, so how the world will respond to that uh, is less certain. We're doing some really interesting oops, work for the um, G7 at the moment where we're looking at the interactions between a resource efficiency agenda, sort of sustainable production and consumption, and climate change, and we find that you could get net gains so you could achieve the two degree target globally um, while getting stronger economic growth uh, for 2050. So it's, that would be a nice outcome if the world was sensible. Um, <coughs> And we find with this internet integrated modelling suite that you can get surprises. So, the, so this slide is telling you that um, the, the differences in household electricity affordability in 2050 are not huge as a function of carbon intensity. Okay, so this is the existing trends with moderate. This is terrible and has stopped doing anything on climate change. These are lower uh, carbon intensity. Uh, but this one, that's when you do market reform to manage peak demand. So peak demand management on top, so it, it assumes that the same things are happening as here. On top of that, it is five times more important for affordability than, than just worrying about the generation side. So for households, transmission and peak demand is really important. So the next report I want to talk about is something called the, the Future Grid Forum. So SARA has done this about five times now. We gathered together uh, a, a bunch of industry participants, experts, uh, companies, we often have 80% of the capital value of a particular industry in the room when we do it in the energy sector. And we talk to them, we say, you know, what are your issues? And then we go away and do geeky modelling things and we come back and say, this is what we found out about your issues. And sometimes they say that's rubbish and we have to go back and do a bit more homework. Uh, and other times they say, wow, that's really interesting. So we did this in 2012 and 2013 uh, and we found a bunch of things that essentially were agreed by all the participants. So all the participants saw this coming. Uh, and it's this bunch of big transitions that, <coughs> you know, not over our lifetime, but over the next decade, we're seeing this big transition from a, a network-centred approach to electricity to a customer-centric approach, from centralised generation capacity to hybrid or decentralised capacity, <coughs> from fossil fuel to a much less carbon intense, and the degree of decarbonisation varies with time and, and so on things, and from a regulated monopoly to things which have a lot more uh, competition in them, even if nobody intended there to be a rule change which would allow that competition. Uh, so that just happens. Uh, and so altogether you've got a potential to have 20 to 50 percent of electricity generated locally uh, by 2050. Uh, and the grid plays a crucial role, but not the same crucial roles it plays now. And so the next 10 years, nine years I guess if I read my slide correctly, is a profound transition. This is really, really disruptive. And most of this is not driven directly by climate change. Climate change is in the background, and some of the technology cost issues wouldn't be happening globally without climate policy, but it's not being driven by Australian climate policy. Um, <coughs> so the next step, and this is the third and last report, but luckily for you, I'll talk for much longer about this so you don't miss out on me being at the front, um, is this thing called the Electricity Network transformation roadmap. And I'll just go through three things. First is the thinking. So this was published uh, late last year. First thing is about how you start thinking about custom, customer uh, reorientation. Um, what are the drivers of these disruption, the transformation drivers? And what did the future grid forum update, where we just ran the previous scenarios and analysis again to see uh, were things different now, a few years later? So on the customer one, this, the, the roadmap assumes this notion of a, a ballad scorecard of customer outcomes, that these are the things that the market research and, and industry engagement tells them that customers want lower costs, they want um, reasonable uh, incentives in the system, they want more choice and control, and I'll come back to the word they in that, because not everybody wants more choice and control. Uh, and many people, and again, you've got a little bit of a split here, where people sit, it's not a spectrum, because some people sit on both ends, um, uh, with uh, decarbonisation and concern about emissions and, and climate change. So there, we're trying to do this balanced scorecard, not just a thing about where, you know, average cost to households is the only thing that matters, or levelised cost to industry, but, but this <coughs> wider range. And then within that, you've got different segments, um, <coughs> and so the, the, 
the segments are empowered, engaged and on the edge and the black ones are basically business uh, electricity customers and the blue ones uh, are household electricity customers. Uh, but the, the thinking is that future electricity customers are becoming uh, increasingly diverse, so they're heterogeneous um, and they're diverse not only in their preferences but their capacities, what they're able to do and control, their degree of effective agency. Um, there's, there's pretty good evidence that they'll still think secure and reliable electricity is a good thing. So, so they want that to maintain. Um, but there are aspects down a level of granularity in that where there are a number of uh, sort of customer segments that would prefer more control rather than the electricity regula regulator telling them you know, this is the degree of security you're going to get and this is the price you're going to pay for it. They want to be able to position on that spectrum to say uh, that degree of security is not required by me. I can manage that um, and I'd rather a, a cheaper price. So you're getting a more sophisticated perspective into what the, what the demand side is, uh, which is really important part of the shift uh, because effectively the electricity suppliers are losing power in this uh, disruption. So when we look at transformation and technology trends, we find that the centralised ge generation technologies, those cost bandwidths are, are compressing, so they're becoming uh, more, more localised, none of them are being pushed out. Uh, <coughs> whether you have CCS and, and global action on CCS is still an important swing variable in there. Um, but you've got this continued trend downwards in the key decentralised technologies, so solar panels, and the cost of batteries continue to track down. So the, whoops, the dotted lines up the top, they're the estimates, best estimates in 2013. And here is the best estimate in two years later, in late 2015. So, you know, they're, they're still going down, but the, sh the sort of uh, this inflection point uh, comes much earlier now, uh, and that's quite significant. So what that tells you is, is it, uh, while generation costs came down a little bit faster than we thought, uh, solar panels and, and storage came down faster, we're still expecting off-grid parity to be achieved in 2030. That's not a long time away. And that's the sort of context for why everything's up in the air. Because once you've got to off-grid parity, if you're a consumer, you don't need to be connected anymore. Uh, and that has very substantial implications for the uh, sector as a whole. So the other thing that's important to note here that while solar panels and, and electric battery storage are the most obvious and the ones that we perhaps have the best data on, there's a whole bunch of other disruptions and so here is CSIRO doing our bit to you know, add to disruptions and building IQ is a very advanced and really simple to use energy management technology for buildings uh, and pooled energy is something else which I'm sure is really cool, but I forgot to ask before I presented the slides um, what it is. <laughs> so apparently you can get it on your phone. Uh, so, so it probably has something to do with managing your solar uh, panel generation and the mix, but I'll go ask somebody else later on if I need to. Uh, yeah, yeah. Uh, and so then the, the update of the, the um, uh, grid forum, we just took the same four scenarios that were developed in 2012 and, and 2013 and these were a combination of technology forces and, and social shifts. Okay, so set and forget, which is you just, you know, do it like your granddad did or your grandmom and uh, leave it alone and trust those energy companies to do the right thing. Uh, there's the rise of the prosumer, which is people who are not necessarily climate or emissions motivated. They just like technology. They're early adopters. They think shiny things are cool. Uh, and th they want a good deal. So they'll drive a hard bargain with their electricity company to get what they want. So this is, so, sort of think of them as the, the home uh, entrepreneur. And then down on the other side, you've got leaving the grid, which tends to have a, a stronger uh, pro-climate motivation about people who want to resp be responsible for their own energy and carbon <coughs> footprint. Uh, and so <coughs> if you're in the city, that's really about the, uh, the solar panels with storage. Uh, and then you've got renewables thrive, which is the, the global scale, the renewable version of leaving the grid. It's, it's converting the grid to, to renewables uh, rather than leaving the grid to get there. 
Um, and when we look at those, <coughs> all of those scenarios involve roughly the same investment costs over the next decade. So it's about a trillion dollars. Um, it certainly rounds to a trillion and it's a nice round number, uh, lots of zeros. Um, but the, the patterns of investment under the hood are quite different. So that matters for the country as a whole. It matters for the performance of the system in terms of variability, uh, cost of supply, so the variable cost aspects and those sorts of things. And it matters quite a lot if you're an energy company with a particular <coughs> existing footprint where you're going to go. So I'll point particularly to um, green, which is the grid on-site generation. It varies a great deal. Um, and the black, which is the, the off-grid um, bundled together generation storage and control systems. Uh, and so they vary a great deal. Centralised generation, the blue, uh, and distribution doesn't vary as much. Uh, but those, those two are the big uh, swing variables. And then when you look across the scenarios from a public perspective, you know, from an everyday person, the, 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 the range of heights of the columns on the left is probably not a big deal for people. It get, gets more varied. Um, in 2050, and the, the uncertainty bars, which is that black whisker at the top, uh, gets larger. Um, but it introduces a new sort of equity issue that by the time you get to 2050, choices for households that go off grid um, and have connected PV, um, oops, their costs, their costs are dramatically lower. So you're comparing this column to that column. They're not quite half, but they're probably about two thirds. And so in terms of access, because some of this is uh, influenced by institutional settings, um, that does raise bigger issues about affordability and equity. Uh, and so what we've done so far is the first stage of this uh, network transformation roadmap. Uh, and the second stage deals with these other ones. Um, but we haven't done it yet, so I won't report on it. So that's it for today. Thank you very much. Thank you, thank you, Steve, for wonderfully setting the stage. And in his characteristic modesty, Steve did not point out that uh, the study that he led um, actually made it onto the cover of Nature, which is an extremely unusual thing for, for social science uh, paper. Congratulations, Steve. Um, any questions for clarification? Um, we've got time for a couple of questions. And if you wouldn't mind just um, uh, introducing yourselves. Uh, Hi, Steve. Um, thanks for that. It was an excellent presentation. Um, just a clarification on the departure of, of consumers from the grid. Mm -hmm. um, so my name is Steve Roshogi. Um, I'm a bureaucrat. Um, can I uh, just, I, I'm wanting to clarify the, the motivations for departing from the grid because you said it might be climate motivated, but I, I suspect it's economically motivated. Yeah, so, so the way the scenarios are framed, departure from the grid occurs under the prosumer one, and the ones that are just simply uh, economically motivated happen more in that space. It does happen across all of them. Um, but the, 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 the desire to be off-grid is more motivated uh, by, by two sorts of factors. One, concern about your emissions footprint. But more than that, it's about wanting to be personally accountable and manage your, your personal footprint. Because if you just care about your footprint, you can buy green electricity and reduce your footprint, but you haven't got that. So it's that sort of closeness, and it, it appeals to different worldviews and personality types, essentially. So. Just behind. Uh, David Haviot, Energy Consumers Australia. Uh, I think it's actually worth pointing out that only one of the four scenarios actually has any significant number of customers going off-grid, and that's mm -hmm. the scenario called going yep. off-grid. Yep. The prosumers, in fact, don't go off grid because they're part of the distributed generation system. They're just using the grid in a different way. Yep. Um, despite the little slide that says it moves from a regulated monopoly to a competitive market, nothing changes the monopoly status of the grid. It just changes how that monopoly is used. It goes from being a one-way system to a two-way transactional system 
but there's no actual competition, and you should get rid of that slide because it was never in the Future Grid Forum work. There is no actual competition for the, um, for the grid. All right, I'll take that on board. And the prosumer label is a producer as well as a consumer. So. Thank you. Um, Steve, in your presentation, you did mention the word security. And I just wanted to clarify, that's availability security. You had the expression security and reliability. Um, has ENA and CSIRO uh, looked at this from the point of view of you know, economic security, um, you know, geopolitical security, uh, in terms of how this is going to work out? Because centrally controlled um, networks have a, an intrinsic high level of security, but the more diverse networks become, obviously, they're more, possibly more vulnerable. Yes, so, so we have looked at, at economic access or affordability for different household segments. So that aspect of security, which is different to reliability, we have looked at. I'm not aware of us doing anything that it looks at uh, you know, geopolitical security, so disruptions to supply and those sorts of things. That would be more relevant in transport fuel than it, than it is uh, for electricity. But, you know, conceivably, people could come and uh, do mean things to, to generation facilities or network infrastructure. It's certainly, sorry, has been involved in looking at that sort of risk analysis for water um, after the Sydney, um, they had a fancy name, Corpro Spiridium um, incident and those sorts of things. So, shall we leave it there? And come yes, back? That's, that's great. Thanks, Steve. And